Week 12, Integrated Marketing Communications. We put advertising, promotion, integrated marketing communications at the end of the introductory subject, in part because it's the most visible high profile aspect of marketing. So it's one that people have seen and quite often associate as marketing. So you, you've seen the billboards, you've seen the adverts, you've seen the pop-up banners. So it's really easy in many respects to misunderstand marketing and think, oh, it's just advertising, oh, it's just messages. Which is why we put it at the back end so you've met the rest of the infrastructure. You've met the other three elements of the marketing mix. You've seen that we've got consumer behavior, market research, strategy. We've got all these aspects to the process. That's not to discount the importance of communication as one of the tools in the equipment list. And we do have a dedicated course, 2031, which does a full semester on the content we're going to cover in three chapters and this last act. So the main thing to understand about advertising from the marketer's perspective, and advertising is playing the proxy role here of promotion communication. We talk, I often talk about this as the magician's other hand. When you watch a stage magician, they have the hand that you're supposed to pay attention to. And then they have the hand that's doing the work. So what you find is in advertising, particularly because billboards, TV ads, sponsored placements, all these things, they are visible. They are visible by design because they're supposed to be visible. You're supposed to see them. But they don't work if you don't have the rest of the marketing infrastructure underpinning the thing that you're making visible. So there's a couple aspects here. Uh, it's the mask. So a lot of times, a lot of criticisms you'll hear about marketing are criticisms about the manipulativeness or oh, advertising it manipulates and well, we're not as powerful as we'd like to be. If we were as good as our critics say, to start with, we wouldn't have critics. We would have just advertised them out of operation. But secondly, we're just simply not as good as our critics make us out to be because a message is nothing if the message isn't tapping into an underlying need or want. If that message is resonating really strongly with an audience, then there's a need or a want here, and it's about how we address that. The final thing uh, around promotion to understand is that there are a lot of laws governing advertising. Australia has a three or four different acts of parliament at the federal and state levels that govern what you're allowed to do. In fact, one of the fastest ways to get an advert banned in Australia is to show someone skateboarding or riding a bicycle without wearing a helmet. That's pretty much your ad's gone. But there are other things. Uh, there's prohibitions on the advertising of tobacco. There's limits on how you can advertise alcohol. You cannot have an advert, an alcohol advert that shows or connects alcohol consumption to action excitement, sexual prowess, or sporting prowess. You cannot um, show high-speed vehicle advertising. There's a series of regulations and self-governance around them. Uh, you can't show a car engaged in dangerous driving behavior, the HSV. Um, high-speed vehicle advertising cannot be showing a high-speed vehicle driving at high speed. All of these come down to a couple of things. There is a sense by the lay community, the non-marketing community, that advertising is more powerful than it is. But also it's really easy to go out and be seen to be doing something by putting a control on advertising. Because it's the big obvious one, and it's the big high ticket, everyone can see it, if you slap it down, then people can see that you were doing something. So regulation control of marketing, there's a lot of stuff around promotion that you've got to watch for, be aware of, uh, and that will vary from market to market product to product and region to region.
Now, a philosophical concept that we are going to use here, but is not a universal philosophical concept in marketing, the notion of the integrated marketing communications. It is a principle that says all actions and aspects of the firm communicate or should communicate a common and connected message. Now IMC then is a wrapper around every activity the company undertakes. The product, the delivery, the all promotional messages, but also the HR practices, the supply chain practices, recycling. Now, if you've gone out and said that you're a green organization selling a green product, people are going to literally go through your garbage cans to see whether in fact you separated your recyclables because there's internet points, kudos, and 20 minutes on a current affair if they can catch you out. The pro side to IMC is this notion of a holistic view, a cohesive, coherent narrative by all of the actions of the firm, which is also potentially a very good thing. So to go back to the idea of a firm that's selling a socially responsible product, you would want a firm that is capitalizing on a social cause or a social issue to also be living that issue to be embodying it. So a company goes out and says, you know, backs International Women's Day, backs uh, sponsors a float at Mardi Gras and supports, puts on an International Men's Day event. You're going to want to find out that their HR practices match the things that they're pouring the money into. If they don't, then you've got very clear evidence that basically, you know, it's pride washing, greenwashing, pinkwashing, it's fake and authenticity is key to success in the long term. But where IMC goes wrong is where it's seen as more important to be on message than it is to actually have a message worth listening to. Um, in particular, the IMC principle of being on message has been absolutely butchered and badly implemented in politics, where it's a story if you're off the brand slogan, but not whether the slogan's worth listening to. So it's more than just being on message. It's saying that if we're going to communicate it, if we're going to sing it, we may as well bring it. Now, the reason we tuck IMC last in the process is on the initial offer, so let's just wind it back for a second. The first time we go to market, IMC sits at the back because you cannot go to market with a new product. So if we think Ansoft Matrix and strategy, new market, new product, we need to have a product. That is the first step. There's got to be a product. The value offer needs to be known. The audience needs to be known. What's in it for them? Communicating. What's the value offer? What's the value proposition? What does it cost? Where can they find it? How? Why would they want it? So from that perspective, IMC is dependent on the rest of the mix giving you something to communicate. It's worth noting at this point that the actions of advertising can alter every other aspect of the marketing mix. In particular, the value of a product in terms of the value offer, the branding and its positioning strategy are reinforced and created through marketing communication. The cost, the social cost of a product can go up as a result of a bad communication strategy or it can go up as a result of a good communication strategy making your product distinctive to a market and rejected by other audiences. So there's a whole range of different rationales for where and how you balance the mix. But I like to approach it from the perspective of communicate when you know what the value offer is, when you know who the target audience is, and you can communicate key messages around 
the exchange around what they need to set around price. What do you need to sacrifice to use the product? But also what you can do with a marketing communications message when you know what the product is and what it does is you can model the behavior so people can see themselves reflected in the people in the advert so they can assume, oh, people like me buy this product and they use it this way, therefore this product is for people like me. So this is why we talk about IMC as a very planned process. So this is drawing it back up to the strategic level and thinking again all the way through. One of the fundamental philosophies of marketing is segmentation, targeting, positioning. So we come right back around. When we get into the integrated marketing communication, your first step is to identify a target audience. Who are you talking to? If you are just standing there on the rooftop with a megaphone shouting loudly into the wind, you're either a performance artist or spam. And you're wasting your time if no, you don't have an audience that you're performing to. So identification target audience, absolutely central to the IMC process, absolutely central to the communications strategy. Because there are people you want to listen to your message and there's people whose opinions you don't care about and people whose opinions you actively seek their rejection. Every product has a pro market. Every product has a market that you don't want your product being used by. So first step in the process ties us back to segmentation, targeting, positioning, ties us back to marketing strategy. And ultimately, that then ties us back to the organizational goal. What is the purpose of our operation? Why are we doing what we're doing? We go through each of these in steps. But the IMC, market segmentation and strategy. What is your goal for addressing the market? Is it a market you already have and you want to reinforce their purchasing, therefore you want them to buy more? Is it a market that you want to introduce them to a new product? Is it a market that you want to introduce to your new product? But also, understanding who the audience is and what they're listening for is really important. Bringing us back to new product development and the ideas around the innovation adoption curve, an innovator wants to know that their product is new, it's novel, it's hitherto unseen. An early adopter doesn't really care about the novelty, they care about the exclusivity. They want to be in the adverts. They don't want to be advertised to, they want to be doing the advertising. An early adopter will cheerfully star in their own advert promoting themselves and your product because that is opinion leadership and they then get something of value. But the very message that you are sending to an early adopter is the opposite message you're sending to an early majority. So 16% of the market want to find out that drinking Pepsi Max isolates you from your friends. Cheers. 33% of the audience wants to find out that Red Bull, it gives you social networks. So one third of the overall audience, the early majority is really keen and the late majority is super keen. So it's about 60% of your audience wants a message, message that says, people like you use our products, be like the others, follow the pack, be one of the crowd, fit in, use our product. And that's super awesome. And that is also something highly respectable People, there is a mass of people who want to be led because that's the thing, that's of value to them. They have a very strong social bonding, social networking elements. They want to be part of communities. They want to be part of groups. And that's a good thing. That provides us with the audience. But if we don't know who our audience is, we don't know their needs, we can get our message wrong. So if you go to uh, an early majority member who's low on novelty seeking and definitely low on independence and say, buy this, it's super new and you'll stand out from the pack, that's their idea of a nightmare. 
Similarly, if you look at things like the Hofstede, uh, the various values in the Hofstede theories, power dynamics, social distance, all these traits and elements, if you send the wrong message to the audience that you're trying to attract, you will repel them. Simultaneously, though, in identifying a target audience, you can identify an audience who you don't want. You can use in-group and out-group as part of your messaging. If you know the needs of your in-group, you can also layer on some out-group rejection. You can put in messages that say, this product isn't for you, and that will give greater value to the community that wants to be tightly knit, wants there to be strength of, uh, is operating by strength of close ties versus the communities that want to spread out and pass the message around, strength of weak ties. Again, it all comes back to your strategy. So even in this, if we start looking at things like the, pro the location of your advertising objective within the product lifecycle. Now the product lifecycle concept, just to quickly recap it, the four phases. When it first meets the market, when it first takes off in the market and picks up traction with a wide range of audiences, where it's reached about as many people as it's going to reach, and when the sales figure starts to decline. In each of those four market categories, there are the opportunities to create different tactical messages that have different purpose. When you introduce a product to a market, you need to let the market know that your product exists. And for the innovators, that may just be enough. It's like, our product is here and now. And the innovator's like, hey, new shiny, I'll go find that for you. In growth, because you're also seeing a bit more competition, you're trying to create desire. But you're also showing use cases. You're explaining to people how to use the product. And that the product is of value to them. Similarly, in maturity, because you're trying to get second sales, third sales, repeat sales, brand loyalty, customer loyalty. You're trying to reinforce the initial purchase, reinforce the desire, and therefore your messaging strategy is much more around post-purchase cognitive dissonance reduction and creating loyalty than it is around creating awareness or creating desire in the first instance. They already know who you are, they already have some liking, now you're reinforcing the liking. And on decline phase, you may choose to message a strategy around, thank you, good night, it's been a blast, couldn't last, we're off, and talk about announcing the decline. Uh, if you're wondering about that, every few years, Windows properties, Microsoft announces that they will terminate the support for a particular product. So they do a defensive marketing campaign around Thank you, Windows 10, for your service. You are no longer required. Introducing Windows Next. And it's an informative for the new product, but it's also a defensive decline. It's communicating that this product's no longer going to be in use. Again, each PLC segment lights up a tactic, each element. Your objectives are quite often for a communication strategy. They will be multifaceted. They will combine elements, but here, because it's basic, it's boot camp, it's intro, we're treating them as four separate styles. Nothing ever works that discreet and independent in practice, but here in training, four discrete styles. Step three is about the determining of the advertising budget. And I'd like to call your attention back to the G. McKenzie uh, G finance model, as I call it, the nine box matrix. The attractiveness, the industry attractiveness, the competitive strength. This is a decision making framework around your advertising. If you're in a high growth, high attractiveness, competitive strength, you, chances are you're going to get a lot of money. You're going to have a lot of budget to work with to try and capitalize on these sorts of opportunities. If you're at the back end of the process, divest, you may not even get an advertising budget. But expand or harvest, you may be in a position where your budget's determined by sales. Your success determines your next success. 
So there are a bunch of different ways to determine an advertising budget. Quite often, you want to be doing it in terms of your strategy. You want to be thinking, where is my best investment? Because advertising is an investment. What's my best return on investment? Where does my advertising budget buy me the best return? Now, having set yourself some money aside, working out your game plan, we're not in the video, we're not going to talk about the different elements of the promotional mix. That's for the textbook to cover. I want to talk about some of the strategic decisions, some of the mind spaces you need to be in to decide what platforms are of use to you. So conveying the message, again, I bring the Ansoft matrix back into play here uh, because if you're communicating to a market, chances are you've got a sales goal or a, an awareness goal. If you've got a sales goal, chances are you have a growth goal. So your odds are in favour of a communication campaign being tied to an Ansoft. So let's link the two for a moment. And what you're looking to do is that in conveying the message, you want to communicate the offering that has value. Any instructions that the offering needs in order to be able to unlock the value. Or if there's a unique selling proposition that's for a specific market, what makes that proposition work? What, why that value offer for that audience? The messaging should also sit alongside your overall overarching strategy. So for example, if we're looking at market penetration, you already have an audience and you want that audience to buy more of what you're selling. So you want to communicate a message of loyalty, retention, but also you want to communicate use. Uh, one of the best use changes that ever occurred was changing the instructions on a shampoo bottle to wash twice a day. Tell them you're using twi twice as much stuff. Morning, noon and night. Communicate that this is not just for breakfast, it's for a meal anytime. Open up the opportunities. Communicate different uses that will require increased consumption of the product if your strategy is market penetration. If your strategy is market development, you already have a value offer that you're familiar with. What you want to do now is show that market using this product so you're demonstrating that this value offer is for this new audience. Now your risk here is that your current audience looks at the new audience and goes, I don't like them, I don't want to associate with them. And this is where tribalism, brand tribalism comes in, where in-group, out-group has its weaknesses, and there are ethics to consider, and there's also whiny fanboys on the internet to kick in the head. Because sometimes, kids, the product ain't for you. And if you are a small niche market that is not making enough money to warrant continuing, and that organization can go to a larger, better market who's going to give them more money and be better to work with, then the market development strategy is about leaving your innovator 2.5% behind and getting on that 16% early adopter bandwagon. But it's all then about communication. You're showing in market development, your message you're showing is this product is for you. In product development, you already have an audience. You've already been addressing this audience. This audience is used to communications from you. So you can introduce them to this new product. Hi, friend. Here's how to use the new thing. Or here's the new opportunity. Or here's the new product. In product development, your messaging is very much around, it's like this and also. So you bundle it together, you use combinations, you show the product in context, you show the product in use, because you need to teach people the behaviors around how to use the product. They already associate you and the brand, they're already loyal to you as customers, now show them how to use the new product. Same for when we get down to diversification. You need to show people what it is, what it does, and how to use it. In fact, one of the smartest things Apple did with the iPod was show, literally, how to rotate it. 
They showed a whole series of games and they showed a whole series of rotations and it was literally an advertising campaign that was an instruction manual. Here's how to use your phone. In terms of media selection, the promotional mix. This is where it gets mentioned here. The book's going to cover it in much better detail on all the different possible options and opportunities. What I'm interested in is getting you to think about how you want to link it. Positioning strategy comes into play, as does target audience. To start with, you want to be thinking, what media, what promotional media can I reach my target audience through? And what does it say about my campaign and therefore say about my firm and my product if I'm advertising through this medium? The medium is the message as much as it conveys the message. The positioning strategy that comes from using old media, new media, such, such that the 20-year-old use of the internet is new media. Giant billboard adverts, outdoors adverts. What does it say about the type of product that advertises there? Advertising in a newspaper versus advertising on a website, the type of website you advertise on. Where does your content fit? One of the things that was discovered uh, with the coronavirus is that there are kill words of phrases that you can request and you can bid not to have your advertising associated with. And usually it's bushfires or natural disasters, certain political figures, certain politics. And the last thing you want is if there's been an airline crash, because the word aircraft has been mentioned a few times, to be trying to sell Qantas. Qantas, quick getaways down the side bar of a big story about an airplane disaster. So obviously there are some non-associations you want to do, but that is also a discovery of some of the highest traffic news articles have non-associations with them because being seen next to this content will say bad things about your brand. So the medium is the message and the channel alignment. Your market needs your target market has a set of needs. They're also, one of the things about this is that your communication is of value to you. You've got to ensure that it is of value to your audience. A completely aggravating pre-roll advert on YouTube is a good excuse to install an ad blocker. And as a professional marketing academic, I endorse ad blockers because our advertising is really bad. Most of the ads that I deal with when the ad blocker is off are just spam. They're mass. They've got no nuance, no target, no purpose. See, every mobile game that has an ad-sponsored piece of content in it with the sponsored content video that looks nothing like the game that it's advertising. The medium is the message, the channel is the message, where do you show up, what does it say about you, it's distribution strategy for ideas. And all the things we talk about in distribution and retailing, functionally, the promotional mix is a series of retail channels for an idea. Now, he will mention it on the way past here, they'll deal with it more on the advertising subject. But creating copy is well down the list. You've made a whole sequence of decisions before you start even trying to come up with slogans or content or copy or how you're going to communicate the results of these decisions. There are functionally three types of outcomes you look for. You want someone to think, you want them to act, or you want them to experience emotion. Feel, think, do. And we can do this in any sequence. We can make you think, engage the cognitive. Then as a result of that thinking, have an emotive reaction, which you then act upon. Or we can get you to act. Bye now, think later. And we get you to act through trial, trial adoption, personal selling, personal experience. Then have the emotional response, then rationalize it post facto. 
we show you kittens playing in fields of roses and play wonderfully sentimental music behind you so you've got the all all the emotion happening so you're vulnerable to a purchase decision it's like feeling then acting or we get you to we play this beautiful songs of your youth and then suddenly you're like hit with an idea and you're making the association between this nostalgia you're feeling for a time you've never been to with your product and it's like yes I should act on that I should buy that product functionally uh, all copy has one of four roles to play and the AIDA model is a very common model I want to raise its attention here uh, awareness interest desire action AIDA awareness again when we step back up into strategy your strategy needs of your copy your overarching content plan needs to align with your overall strategy a new product has more need for awareness if the market research says that once people know about your product they like your product emphasize awareness people know about it but they don't know if it's for them you need to increase interest and I've tied these here to some of the stuff around new product development, around the Rogers Five advantages, relative advantage. Interest is about compatibility and relative advantage. What do I want this? What does it do for me that's better than what I'm currently experiencing? Desire is about getting that movement from, I see a point, I know it exists, I want one. And action is the call to how to act on that desire. These don't have these are presented in a linear format, but they don't have to be delivered in a linear format. We teach you the four in this order, you can implement them in any order. And that's one of the things to realize is that we teach you things in boxes and sequences for pedagogical reasons, simplicity, and welcome to the theory. However, in practice, you can do it however best suits you. One of the other things I just want to bring up is uh, this classic model. Uh, again, uh, one of the things about this, I mentioned a few times during marketing that you find yourself in the middle of a theory. Congratulations, you are here. I'm going to explain this slide by being the source. Now, I come with the credibility of being the lecturer of the subject and 20-year veteran of academia. I tell you the story of this model. So in coding, in coding, when I use examples, and that creates the message. Now, my field of experience, whilst quite extensive, only has a very small overlap with your field of experience. So if I start using examples and catchphrases from the 90s of my formative training period, it may have absolutely no relevance to you whatsoever. So there is a challenge here. The message that we create needs to have, the sweet spot is the overlap between my experience and what I can encode and your experience, so you decode it in the same way. When you're encountering new content, you're going to find that the field of experience overlap is somewhat minimal, and there's a bit of a challenge there. But the better you know your audience, the more likely you are to be able to put your message closer to the sweet spot. The message is then decoded. It's translated by you, the receiver, into your uh, schema of knowledge. We have the feedback loop here, which is either an action. So we want you to raise awareness. You know about us. But we want you to take action. We want you to buy stuff. The feedback loop can be sales. It can be purchasing. Any way for me to know that you've engaged with my material and understood it. Inside this, we also have noise. And noise is a huge part of the channel when miscommunication, misinterpretation, there's a whole range in which, a whole series of ways, even literal actual noise, like partial distortion of a message, uh, 
billboard that's partially blocked, an incomplete line of sight to an advert, the advert's on mute, you won't really pay attention. All those things create noise in the channel. Now this model describes communication. It's a theoretical, conceptual, high-level model of communication. And congratulations, you're experiencing it right here, right now, as you're watching this. Marketing is cyclical, real-time, and very meta on occasions. All right, the impact, metrics. Good way to really be coming out to the tail end of a semester. Advertising has some of the strongest metrics associated with it because it has some of the strongest budgetary constraints. I, uh, my strategic and professional worldview is that advertising is an investment that needs to return on the investment. Metrics help you show that your investment were, your investment is reaching its goal. If advertising is treated as a cost, costs get cut. Investments, you don't talk about cutting investments. You talk about perhaps selling off some of your investments, but your investments have a more positive connotation. So we need in advertising to have some metrics, uh, and the metric element here is really, what was the goal? What was the purpose of communication? Did it attain that goal? Did your communication act to the purpose that you set out to do? Uh, one of the risks around metrics is the what gets measured gets done, uh, as opposed to what I argue you should be doing with the metric is whatever it is you're doing should be something that you measure. If you're running ads on TV, then you should be seeing whether people are responding to that ad. One of the best pieces of metrics I've ever heard of was a radio advertising campaign that spoke the URL of a website, knew what time their ads were being played on the radio, and then tracked hits to that website. What was the time lag between hearing it on the radio and going to the website? And that was a clear metric of, it was a call to action. For more information, go to wattlecourses.anu.edu.au. Clear call to action, and then you could measure the success. So a metric needs to be tied to the goals. It needs to, it is a market research data set. It drives decision making. So metrics are data sets, data sets that need to be interpreted and used for decision making. And ultimately, one of the things with marketing is that we are an experiment. All advertising is experimental. It is putting a message into the, the system, seeing how people react, reacting to that, reacting to the reaction. If you're not measuring it, then you don't know what the reaction is. So to recap, to close out, advertising, promotion, integrated marketing communication, and the promotion mix. Key ideas inside marketing, one quarter of the marketing mix, a full subject dedicated to it, we've looked at the strategic top level overview of why and how. The textbook will look at the technical elements of what the promotion mix elements look like, what they can be used for, and why you would want to use them. Promotion ties together the rest of the marketing mix. If you're not communicating what the offer is, and you're not communicating what it costs and what you need to sacrifice to acquire it and where you get it from, then you're letting your rest of your mix down. But without the rest of the mix, you've got no message to send, you've got nothing to tell, so you need to combine both marketing communications as a means for value creation, and value creation of the offering that has value as a reason to communicate with your desired target audience.